Okay. All right. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death, amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end, amen. The theme of today is Mary, Mother of God. In 431, the Council of Ephesus, the Third Ecumenical Council, proclaimed Mary as Mother of God, Theotokos, Theotokos, against the teaching of the Patriarch of Constantinople, who wanted to proclaim Mary only Christotokos. There is the mother of Christ only. There is a reason why the church said Christotokos, the mother of Christ, is not sufficient. We need to call her Theotokos, mother of God. Why? The concept of Theotokos started with the Gospel of Luke. If you remember, when Mary was pregnant with Jesus, and she hastened to meet her cousin Elizabeth. And Elizabeth met her, and John the Baptist leapt for joy in the womb of Elizabeth. Elizabeth said, how do I deserve that the mother of my Lord should come to me? By calling Mary the mother of my Lord, St. Luke, as you know, the Gospels are, were written in Greek. The Gospel of Luke used the Greek term kurios, kurios, Lord. That Greek term that St. Luke used is also used in the Old Testament to, indi to indicate Yahweh, the God of Israel. So for a Jew, to hear Elizabeth saying to Mary, the mother of my Lord, would be the ultimate scandal. Because the God of Israel is transcendent, is totally beyond becoming man in the womb of any woman. It's way, way above all creatures, all creations. So the concept of curious used by Luke intentionally is to basically say, this one, this baby inside of the womb of Mary, who was curious, is God himself. Beyond any doubt, the strongest expression that you can ever see in the gospel about Mary being the mother of my Lord. Are you with me so far? Now, what, what is the meaning beyond that? When the church wanted to confirm that Mary is the mother of the Lord, the church had to use an expression that is an adequate expression. And the church shows the concept Theotokos. Now, the word Theotokos is divided into two expressions, two words. The first one is Theos, which means God, and the verb is tikto. Tikto in Greek means generate, means generate. But not only generate, okay? The word tikto means generate in the full sense of the word. In other words, Mary, when she conceived Jesus, Jesus was conceived in her and grew in her womb according to the natural laws of gestation. Remember at the beginning of the few centuries of the church, a lot of people came and said, against the teaching of the church, of course, well, the human nature of Christ is only appearing. It's not a true flesh. Jesus just passed by her, just like the ray of the sun passes through the window. The church said, no, 
the church teaches very clearly that the incarnation in the incarnation the, the son of god the son of the father was truly and completely conceived in her womb that is the mystery of the incarnation look at it for one second here so this is the father this is the son and this is the holy spirit the blessed trinity is made out of three different persons each one of the three persons is equal to the other one but this divine nature here is not like divided it's not like the father has part of it the son has another part and the third one the holy spirit has the third part no it doesn't work this way the father possesses the entire divine nature according to his fatherhood as a father the son possesses the entire divine nature according to his sonship the holy spirit possesses the entire divine nature according to his properties as the holy spirit every single divine person possesses the entire divine nature each according to his properties so please be very careful not to divide the divine nature are you with me so far now when i say that the virgin mary is the mother of god i am not saying that the virgin of Ma the virgin mary is the mother of the trinity be very careful i am saying that the virgin mary is the mother of the son god the son so when i say mary is the mother of god i'm saying mary is the mother of god in parenthesis the son okay because the father did not incarnate the holy spirit did not become man <coughs> only the son the second person of the trinity became man in the womb of mary before i continue i would like to make a distinction between the concept of nature and the concept of person okay when i say the word god the word god indicates a nature when i say the father indicates a person the word nature in greek is physis the word person in greek is hypostasis these two terms played a huge role in the theology of the early church especially leading to say mary is the mother of god in what sense let me let me say a word indicating nature if i say woman the word nature indicates a universal principle that encompasses includes every woman if i say woman i including you 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 correct if i say teresa or Emily, or Joyce, or Angie, I am indicating a person. The nature is universal. The person individualizes the nature. Make that nature concrete. Do you remember the famous argument between Aristotle and Plato? Aristotle basically said, nature cannot exist except being individualized the concept of woman does not ex exist just like that it must be kate or Teresa or whatever correct plato said no the concept does exist he came with the theory of the abstract and of course the church for thousands of years adopted more the concept of aristotle because aristotle said when the nature exist it must exist in a person it must be individualized in a person now understand any question about that so let me now go back to the incarnation in the mystery of the incarnation the ultimate dimension of that mystery is the fact that the second person of the trinity and only the second person the son was sent by the father 
and became man in the womb of the Virgin Mary. The person of the Son is divine, but he was acting in a human nature. So, when this baby Jesus was born in the very concrete historical dimension of our humanity, the, the subject, the I, is divine, but he was acting in a human nature. And the motherhood is the motherhood of a person. You say, Jessica is the mother of Eli. We don't say Jessica is the mother of man. Of course he's a man. But the motherhood is the motherhood, motherhood of a person. Am I correct or no? So, when the mystery of the Incarnation took place, the ultimate dimension is the fact that the subject of Jesus Christ, the I, the Ergo of Christ is divine, even though he was acting in a human nature. So when Jesus was walking on the streets of Galilee, was God walking on the streets of Galilee? Yes, he was, but in his human nature. When Jesus was walking on the water, was God walking on the water? Yes, yes but in his human nature. When Jesus went to the bathroom, <laughs> did God go to the bathroom? Yes. He did, but in his human nature. When Jesus died on the cross, did God die on the cross? Yes, but in his human nature. When Jesus ascended into heaven, did God ascend into heaven? In his human nature. Now, ladies and gentlemen, that is the mystery of salvation. The mystery of salvation that before the Incarnation, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in their divinity as God, did not have the, the new element that Jesus brought up with him after his ascension into heaven. After the Incarnation, when Jesus went up to heaven with his glorified human nature, a new element is added to the Trinity, and that is the risen humanity of Jesus Christ. When Jesus ascended, he did not leave the human nature he took from Mary behind him and went back to the way he was before. No. No. You're missing the whole point. The whole point is for Christ to take on a human nature and bring it back to the bosom of the Trinity. That is the mystery of salvation. That is the mystery of salvation. That's why, if, do you remember when um, Adam and Eve were thrown out of the paradise? What does the book of Genesis tell us? And God put an angel at the door, right? Protecting the gates of paradise. In other words, now the human nature that was created to be in harmony Original justice with God, now that human nature is kicked out. By doing that, Jesus, by rising from the dead and taking that human nature back to the Father, now the gates of paradise are reopened because there is a new element, and that is the risen human nature of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen, therefore, the concept of Mother of God is so amazing that it, it really is the Holy Spirit talking to the church by giving us this wonderful concept because the human nature is the human nature of the Son and the Son is the one who is with the Father and the Holy Spirit. That mystery we call because it is the human nature of the person the divine person acting in a human nature. That's why we call it, the church called it the hypostatic union. Hypostatic union. So, Jesus Christ is one person, not two persons. If you look at him in, in the Holy Land, do you see two people? 
If you see two people, you have to go and see an eye doctor. You see one person. But that person is at the same time human and divine. Two natures. Two natures. He is God. That's one nature. He is man. That's a second nature. Two natures united in one person. We call this the hypostatic union. And since Mary is the mother of a person, not only the mother of nature, a mother of a person, and that person is God the Son, we call her Mother of God. Any questions so far? Is that crisp clear to you? No questions? Good. Consequences. What are the implications? The implications of this term, Mother of God, are amazing. It sheds light on many different aspects of our Catholic faith that are beyond your imagination. Let's go one step at a time. First, when I say Mary is the mother of God, not only the mother of Christ, what am I implying? I am implying that Jesus Christ is God. If I say Mary is the mother of Christ, Christotokos, like the patriarch wanted to say, and stop right there, you leave, you're leaving loose ends in there. You are not confirming that Christ is God. What if you say she is the mother of Christ, and then we stop right there, and what if some people don't believe Jesus Christ is God? Christianity, Catholicism, is based on the fact that Jesus Christ is God himself, God the Son in the flesh. Christianity is not a religion that came to teach us a set of commandments. Christianity, Catholicism, is not a religion that came to tell you, well, nirvana is wonderful. No, it's not. To be one with the universe. No. You have to be very careful. Those, uh, no, 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 nothing against the, the Chinese nirvanas or any of that, but these are human practices, you know what I'm saying? And uh, they believe like when you, uh, you, you practice these human things and you become one with the universe and after you die, uh, your being disappears and become one with the, are you kidding me? Are you like, are you kidding me? The most important consequences of salvation in the Catholic teaching of the church is the fact is in this life you perfect your being. You bring it to the highest dimension to which God created you to be. It don't disappear. We want fullness of being, not disappearing of being. Do you understand that? Do you want to go and become one nature, one with the nature, and sit under the tree and read a book? Wonderful. You do this after you receive the Eucharist and confession and your rosaries and all that stuff. Then you can do whatever you want in nature. That becomes an implication, not the basis. Do you understand? The, that word, Theotokos only, encompasses that dimension that Jesus Christ is God. Christianity, Jesus Christ is not some a teacher. Jesus Christ is God who is capable of giving life to you. The grace of the Trinity. The grace means God's life in us. Ontologically, <coughs> metaphysically, somebody who is capable of being more intimate to you than your own self. That is the meaning of Theotokos when we say we are implying that Christ is that life-giving God who took your nature, your nature, your nature back to the Father. The only reason when you die, the only reason you are going to be capable of sharing God's nature, sharing God's life, the Trinity, in a glory beyond your imaginations, is because the human nature of Christ is there. And that's the only reason. If Christ didn't do that, no salvation for anyone. That's the first implication. Second implication. 
when we say Mary is mother of God, we, elim we are eliminating several erroneous teachings at the beginning of the church. One of them is called adoptionism. Adoptionism in the church, first couple of centuries, they said that Jesus Christ is a wonderful man, not God, but he was adopted by God at the time of baptism, when he received the Holy Spirit. That's, he was adopted by God to be a kind of superman, above all creatures, but not divine. If you do not accept that Jesus Christ is divine, you are either a Jew or a Muslim or someone who does not believe basically in, in the teaching of the Catholic Church. Or Jehovah Witness. Jehovah Witness do not believe that Jesus Christ is God and therefore they cannot be called Christians. I mean, nothing is wrong with all of these people. God bless them. I mean, I'm not talking, they're not going to be in heaven. God bless, they will make it to heaven. God, God is good. But all I'm saying is the center of human history and salvation is the fact that Jesus Christ is God. So when we say Mary is Theotokos, mother of God, you are implying that the one born of her is God himself, and therefore you reject adoptionism. Second erroneous teaching that came up at the beginning of the church is docetism. Docetism, believe it or not, denied that Jesus Christ is fully human. They said, when God came down, he did not, he wasn't formed in the womb of Mary according to the laws of gestation. No, they said, not the church, of course, that his flesh was appearing, he didn't really suffer in the full sense of the word. The church, the word Theotokos, implies there is a motherhood, and that motherhood is a true motherhood of a true man who was born from the Virgin Mary. When, if you poke the blood, the, the body of Jesus, your finger will touch flesh like my flesh and yours. And when he suffered, he suffered truly on the cross. Do you think Jesus Christ suffered like it was all fake that he suffered on the cross? Please. No, he truly suffered on the, on the cross. And actually, the better you are of a person, the more you suffer. So imagine how much his deeper suffering, his suffering was deeper, not only on the level of physical suffering, also moral suffering, because he was rejected by the very people <coughs> that he did all the miracles and for them and, and helped them in, in a million ways to understand who he is. And of course today, the, the word mother of God rejects Gnosticism, reducing Christ to a myth. Gnosticism, always from the beginning of the church, <coughs> still exists today, rejects the human dimension of the church. Ladies and gentlemen, there is a concept from the beginning of the church, especially with the fathers of the church, called the oikonomia, the economy of salvation. Economy of salvation means the way God wanted to save us. God could have God, instead of becoming man, could have, he extended his hand from heaven and said, come on, I'm saving you. Could he have done that? Yes. Yeah and no. Yes, because nothing is impossible to God. No, because he did not choose that way. He chose, if God himself decided that the second person of the Trinity decided to become man in the womb of Mary, if this is how he chose to save us, who are you to choose another way? If God decided to honor the creation, the human element, the human nature, by making that nature his nature, who are you to eliminate the human 
the human uh, element. Every single heresy, every single erroneous teaching from the beginning of the church until today is caused by the fact that people misunderstand the theory of the incarnation. And therefore, they eliminate the human element. You eliminate the human element, guess what? All of a sudden, you eliminate. We don't need a church. Just We need the Bible, for example, people say. Why do I need the church? The church is our human beings. We don't need that. We only need faith. Faith and you are saved. No church, no sacraments, no human dimension. That's called Gnosticism. All of these currents of thoughts and the religion that are opening their own shopping centers. Okay, Publix is here. Well, we don't like Publix. I'm going to go to Walmart. Okay. The church doesn't function this way. You can't just start your own church. The church has a founder. The church is human and divine at the same time, just like Jesus was a human and divine. When you look at Jesus, you see a man, correct? But that man was God. When you look at the water of baptism, you see water, right? But that water, when you baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, you receive the grace of the Trinity. You look at the bread in the Eucharist, it looks like bread. But that bread is the body of Christ. So every single element in the church always parallel human and divine. The human element is being used. The divine element is being confirmed as we are using the human element. Why? Because we are human. Because we are human. And the only way God can function in our human life is by using human elements as he is conferring the divine grace. Okay? Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to a little bit push it and scandalize you a little bit in a good way. What does the letter of St. John say about those who deny that God came in the flesh? The Antichrist. The an St. John called them, pushed it to the point, say the Antichrist. Anyone who does not acknowledge that the Son of the Father Cain in the flesh is the Antichrist. Be very careful. Salvation in the understanding of the Catholic Church is based exclusively on the Incarnation. And therefore, many times when I hear some homilies of some priests or some people or whatever, and the whole talk is about God, 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 God. That's wonderful. God, God, the ultimate, they talk for half an hour or an hour about God. Wonderful. God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Wonderful. But that God became flesh. And if you look at the beginning of the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But that Word, and the Word, became flesh and he dwelt among us. Actually, the translation of dwelt among us is very weak because you, you can't just translate the Greek word. Eskinosen is not only dwelt among us, he actually threw his own tent among our tents. He became one with us. Questions? Anyone? Yesterday we had a wonderful time. And say, do you understand the concept of incarnation now? And how is that related to one word, Mother of God, Theotokos? Do you understand that? Any questions? Yes, Rob. Okay, um, it sounds to me like Protestants, by definition, they're agnostics because they don't believe in the uh, body and blood of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> I wouldn't call the Protestant Gnostics. Our, our brethren, the Protestants, are good people. They are Christian. They believe in Christ as our Savior. 
They believe in scripture, they believe in heaven, we have a lot of in common with them. But I would say there is one element they need to add to their theology is the fact that the human element, you cannot deny the human element because the, the word became flesh. The human element was used by God himself for salvation. Jesus Christ, according to the Second Vatican Council, uh, that says, Jesus Christ used his human nature to save the humanity. Used his human nature to save humanity. I have a question for you. So, the Son, who is God himself, right? Became man in the womb of the Virgin Mary, right? Okay. Well, him being God and divine, did he leave? <coughs> The Father and the Holy Spirit? Did he, like, like, is the Trinity now only Father and Holy Spirit? Did he leave? Of course he did not. On his divine level, he did not. You, you can't, he can't leave the Father and the Holy Spirit. He's, he's God, okay? But that's why we say in the letter to the Philippians, he emptied himself. Empty, kenosis. He emptied himself and took on the form <coughs> of a man, took on human nature. Okay? We see that fluctuating between humi humanity and divinity of Christ many times in Scripture. For example, when, um, when um, G Mary found Jesus in the temple and she took him back and Jesus said, uh, I had to be in my father's business. Why are you looking for me so anxious? And uh, uh, the, the boy was growing in wisdom. He was growing in wisdom. Did he have to grow in wisdom? He is God. Oh yeah, he did. Because that God, he took an authentic human nature. So the gospel would say sentences like this. For you to understand, it's not a magic. So the human nature, the consciousness of Jesus is not a magic. Now, let me give you a simple example. When you, when you were born, okay? When you were born, you started growing up. When you became, what? Four, five, six, seven, let's say. You acquired a consciousness who you are, right? So, at a certain point, you were aware, my name is Leslie, I'm a human being, I'm a woman, I, work, I live in the, in the United States. So, you became aware of who you are at a certain point in your life, correct? In the case of Jesus, it's the same way. Even though the subject is divine, but that divine subject had a human consciousness. He was united truly to human nature. At certain point, in the same way, Leslie or Kathy, you become aware that you are a human person. Jesus became aware that he is a divine person who became man. That's why the, ch the church rejects the teaching of those who say, well, Jesus became conscious of him being divine only at the time of baptism. No. No, Jesus acquired a human consciousness of his divinity in the same way a human person acquires a consciousness of being human. Imagine for 30 years he doesn't know who he is and then he was baptized, received the Holy Spirit and all of a sudden, oh my gosh, I love it, I'm God. <laughs> Bring it on. <laughs> it doesn't function this way, right? Acquiring human consciousness of his divinity just like you acquire human consciousness of your humanity okay we see but at the same so in the gospel we see he was growing in wisdom in the sense that he did develop a consciousness a human consciousness of who he is but at the same time many times we see a bold affirmations of his divinity the one who sees me sees the father I and the Father are one. I am life. I am the resurrection. And of course, the ultimate scandal to the Jews was John chapter 8. When they said, 
Who do you think you are? You're not even 50 years old and you are claiming to be older than Abraham. Who are you? He told them, I am. He used the same word that God told Moses in the burning bush. Tell, go and tell the Israelites, I am. I am the being. I am the <coughs> act pur, actus purus. God is the I am, the existence. In one shot, he looks at the entire human uh, history and understands and sees and controls every thought, every action. In God, there is no divisions. There is no sequence of, of time. In God, there are no diversification. It's one. It's an existence, a pure, incredible existence of glory, infinite existence. No change. No change. All right there. One shot. Questions? No more questions? Okay. Well, thank you for being here today. I hope I, I was clear enough. Are you sure? Before any, any concept is not totally clear, before I leave, this is your chance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our But deliver us from evil. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you, Father. I want to tell you one more thing. So, um, you believe.